Golta, we know that in Montana there's a lot of hunters, a lot of gun enthusiasts, so you might as well shop local when you're looking for your next firearm or accessory, huh? So I Army, they got the best prices around and the best service you'll find anywhere. As the guys over there will tell you, shop with So I Army for a year, we guarantee you, you'll save some money. The other thing is they have great knowledge. There's a lot of questions that people have about the right styles and types to suit them and what it is that they're trying to do. And all the guys over at Selway Armory know their firearms and ammunition and accessories inside and out. With locations in both Missoula and Bozeman, Selway Armory has some specialty products as well, including full Sig Sauer inventory for your best in handguns and much, much more. Like Coulter said, two brick-and-mortar locations, one in Missoula, one in Bozeman, and also online, tremendous inventory there. They'll ship everything you want, selwayarmory.com. So I'll quickly wrap up uh, the, uh, the Cal Poly game. You know, clearly um, I thought our guys did a nice job of handling a tough environment. Um, the kind of my, one of my bigger takeaways, and I really felt this going in, I really felt like listening to what Coach Walsh had to say throughout the course of the week, I felt like he thought their team was going to beat us. Uh, they were very confident, and uh, he's an excellent football coach. Stylistically, I think it's obvious that uh, you know, their ability to take away possessions and kind of play keep away can really affect the flow of, the, uh, of our offense. And uh, certainly us not being able to score on that first possession was, it was a huge turning point in the first half because uh, we never got the ball back until the second quarter. And so uh, that was, I thought, a, a you know, really well-executed game plan on their part. I think they did pretty much everything that they needed to do to win that game. Uh, they uh, dominated time of possession. They did not turn the ball over with the exception of the one interception late in the game that was almost inconsequential. And, uh, and they operated their option and their system very, very well. On the other side, I felt like uh, after we went up 28 to seven, we kind of took our foot off the gas pedal. And we had essentially back-to-back -back turnovers that gave them a ton of momentum. Uh, a six yard punt equates to a turnover in my book. And so uh, we gave them the ball you know, inside the 20 and inside the 40, and they capitalized on those short fields and that made it a ball game. And to our guys' credit, uh, we went out and reestablished our dominance in the, in the overtime period, uh, did not allow them to score, and took us three plays to put it in and end it. Now, if we'd had the same approach that we had in overtime, we might not have had to play extra football if we'd had that approach in the fourth quarter. But the bottom line is, road victories in the Big Sky Conference are hard to come by. And I don't care who you're playing, where you're playing them, it's going to be a war, and especially when you're playing a good football team with excellent coaching staff like Cal Poly. And so congratulations to our team on that victory. Uh, our players of the week this week on offense, uh, Travis Johnson obviously gave us a big, big spark, did a tremendous job of operating at the quarterback position, not just making plays from the quarterback position, but also obviously making some big plays for us as a receiver in the pass game. Uh, defensively, Callahan O'Reilly, I thought Derek Marks, give him a shout out, had a tremendous week, especially uh, in overtime when we needed some critical plays. But Callahan O'Reilly, sideline to sideline, probably the best plays the game he's played as a Bobcat, tremendous job there. And then on special teams, James Campbell continues to be impactful for us in terms of covering kicks. And so uh, proud of those guys and the job that they did. And now it's on to, uh, I think, uh, every year in this league, you're going to have that team. Last year, I think it was kind of Cal Davis that came out of nowhere and just emerged as a dominant force in this league. And certainly this year, you can see that that's Sacramento State, without a doubt. When you're six games into a, a season, uh, you can pretty much look at the stat sheet and see who a team is. And they are number one in the conference in total defense as well as scoring defense. They are number two in the conference in, uh, in total offense and scoring offense. So they're one of the best teams in this league, without a doubt. And I think that uh, when you look at who they played and where they played them, they gave uh, Arizona State, who's uh, one of the better teams in the Pac-12 South, all they wanted, a 19-7 game down there in Tempe. And then uh, was really a tie game for going into the, to the fourth quarter against Fresno State, a very good Mountain West team. And they've been dominant in each one of their back in each one of their uh, their Big Sky games, a 50 to nothing, basically dismantling of Northern Colorado. Sorry, Jason, and uh, and then a really dominant performance against uh, Eastern Washington, uh, the national runner-up a year ago. And so I think this is a complete football team. Uh, Coach Taylor, guy that was a Pac-12 coordinator not too long ago at the University of Utah, a very good football program, and he surrounded himself with good people. Andy Thompson a veteran coach in this league, 13 years to the last 10 as the defensive coordinator at, uh, at Northern Arizona, a guy that's very familiar with this, with this conference and has been a, a, a well-respected coach for a long time. His D-line coach is Craig Paulson, who's been a Division I coordinator both uh, 
at, at UNLV, as well as uh, multiple stints at the University of Montana. Cherokee Valeria, their, their secondary coach, was a guy that was on the uh, Eastern Washington staff for years and years. And so he's done a really nice job of building a staff that has familiarity with the Big Sky Conference. Troy himself is a guy that coached at, uh, at Folsom High School there prior to getting into college coaching and won CIF championships there. And, uh, you know, well, well respected offensive mind. In fact, his offensive line coaches, Chris Richardson, they were co-head coaches at Folsom at one point in time. I recruited down there in Sacramento. Great guys, uh, really quality people, but even better, you know, great football coaches, even better people. So respect the job that he's doing right now. Offensively, you know, it's kind of a three-headed monster. You got their quarterback makes everything go. The Thompson kid is a true dual threat. I mean, he's a guy that can, he's a bigger, phys more physical runner. He's not necessarily a, uh, you know, a guy like what we saw last week. Uh, in number four from Cal Poly, but uh, they're going to run a lot of the same type of stuff that you see maybe like a Travis or a Troy run in our offense. Q, re Q punch read, uh, some zone read stuff, but he is a between the tackles guy. He's not going to shy away from contact, big physical dude. Uh, and also has the ability to hurt you with his arm, which is not always the case with that style. The, the running back, uh, the Dotson kid, man, he's fast. That's how I would describe him. He was the most productive rusher in the Big Sky Conference a year ago. Uh, but they have uh, number 21, the Perkins kid, is a very good, uh, very good back as well. You see them use both of those guys in the backfield at times. And then they've got multiple targets, the primary target being number 84, who uh, the Williams kid is just a, he's a matchup problem. He's a 6'2", 200-pound kid, and he can really stretch the field vertically, wins a lot of 50-50 balls, powerful guy. But they've got other targets. They've got 4 and 17 that are kind of the you know, undersized guys that are small speed guys that are really hard to get on the ground. Number nine, a true freshman from Folsom High School up the road, doing a nice job for him. So I think that's kind of what I see on offense. You're going to have to defend a lot. Formationally, they do a good job of making you work on formation in the boundary, condensed sets, shifts, motions. I think there's a lot of similarities uh, between what they do and what we do. Uh, there might be a little bit of difference in terms of how they're going about it, but uh, stylistically, I don't think it's that much different. I do think that Thompson has uh, is, is done a nice job of giving them that vertical threat in the intermediate passing game as well. So. Uh, that's what I see on offense. On defense, I think their front seven is really good. I think they're really good. I think the um, 95, I think it's Choate with an S. I don't know if that's pronounced correctly or not. Uh, he's a really, really good player. Uh, uh, Obinia, number 99, and then 44, Erickson. Those guys stand out to me uh, as playing really hard. I mean, I just love the way these kids play. Like, they're, they're not the biggest front in the league, but they are active, very physical, Relentless in pass rush, well coached. I think they do a really nice job. In the back end, the Bland kid, 37. And, and it shows up not just with him, but I think he's the guy that stands out the most to me on film. A very aggressive secondary. They're going to get their hands on you, reroute you. They're going, to, they're, they're going to make it difficult for you to get into open space. And then in the kicking game, you know, they've got some dangerous return, man. I think this is uh, the best team that we have played. Uh, certainly the best FCS team that we have played. And uh, they're a complete team. And I think it's, uh, you know, I think this is one of the better teams in the country. I really believe that. And so we're going to have our hands full, and uh, I'll have our guys' attention this week. Questions? You mentioned uh, Thompson. Um, you, 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 through, the, through the air, I guess, you, what kind of stands out to you about him uh, passing-wise? You mentioned how he can hurt you with his arm, too. Yeah, I, I think con concept-wise, it's you, you kind of see the same passing concepts almost year, week in and week out from different teams. How they get to him are a little bit different. They create some problems for you with the, what we call formation into the boundary. So they'll flood the boundary side. You'll see a lot of, you know, kind of layered passing into the short side of the field. And he does a really nice job of identifying kind of who the uncovered guy is. Um, he's got a comfort level with the Williams kid, 84. He'll target him anywhere on the field. And then they have some specific plays to get the ball to their kind of their scat guys, their smaller guys in space. But he's an accurate passer, um, a little bit streaky, but he's an accurate passer. And then again, you know, it's not just the design quarterback runs that he can hurt you with. They'll run, uh, you know, he's going he's gonna to extend plays and create outside the offense, and you're going to have to defend him even when things break down. You look at Dotson, he's also a weapon in that pass game as well. 33 catches on the year for him. How do you defend him out of the backfield? Well, he's a, ma he's a matchup problem because they want to get him on a linebacker, and he's faster than any linebackers we have. I mean, I'm guessing this kid was probably, if he was a track guy in high school, he was probably a 10'6", 10, 10'700 meter guy, and he can really roll. And so for us to be able to match that, it's going to be uh, um, a little bit difficult because, you know, you don't want to just sit there and play zone and let Thompson pick you apart. And you don't want to get play, playing man where they're going to, you know, they're going to run their rubs and their pick routes and get him 
in space, and uh, and they're going to look for those matchups on the linebackers. And so we've got to be smart about how we approach it. Coach, going back to, to Thompson, he's a you mentioned he's a dual threat quarterback, but you guys are no stranger to a dual threat quarterback. You've played plenty of them this season. Uh, do you guys feel like maybe you've established some sort of a blueprint to how do you kind of manage the ability a dual threat quarterback kind of presents to you? Well, you know, certainly we played a, a, a guy with a not quite a similar skill set, but stylistically was similar against um, – against Norfolk State, and then last week, even though the guy's very much a dual threat guy, what you have to do defensively actually plays into that kid's hands because, you know, you're not really running your standard defense. And so, really, for us, it's, it's like we didn't even watch the Cal Poly game. We just moved right on to Sac State. We got to watch that and move on because stylistically it's so different, and we have seen a little bit more. I think, like I said, we'll probably do a lot of service periods this week. There's not a need for us to do a ton of scouts. I think there's a ton of similarities between what they do on offense and what we do on offense, and we can give them the looks that they're going to that they're going to present to us on defense. And so I think it's going to be a lot of good on good this week. Um, I don't think there's any one magic kit pill or blue blueprint. I mean, every week is different, and I think especially because of the the level of talent these guys have at running back, wide receiver, even tight end, quarterback. I mean, you've got to defend a lot against Sacramento State. You mentioned Callahan. Uh, what kind of gave you the confidence to go with him at that middle linebacker spot before? Yeah, he's been playing really well anyway. I mean, I, I've said it a number of times. You probably could have flipped a coin between he and Nolan uh, all the way back to fall camp. But he's bigger than Nolan. And a guy that, you know, is 230 pounds versus a guy that's 215, 220 pounds against the style that they're going to play downhill in your face all night, we felt like that was uh, going to be beneficial for us. Um, and, then, you know, that showed up on the, on the shot he put on their fullback on the goal line. But uh, also the thing that really impressed me was how he played off cut blocks and was able to run to the ball had a number of tackles for loss or short gains, running the alley force from the inside linebacker, and he did that by beating blocks to get there. And so uh, it wasn't just his physical presence in the box, but also his ability to play laterally that gave us the confidence to, to roll with him. I think last year you described your offense with, with Troy as a single wing. Um, I guess how would you describe it this year and how, how, as it keeps evolving? Well, I, you know, I mean, I think we're a multiple spread offense. You know, I mean, we're a run first, and we do have some – some single wing elements, but obviously when you're snapping the ball directly to the quarterback and letting him run with it, I mean that, you know, it, what's old is new. You know, I mean it's everything evolves, and I think that um, even though we're not a triple option style, I think we make teams defend a lot. And I see the same thing out of Sacramento State, except for you probably have to defend the the forward pass more against them than you do against us. And so, um, I, I like I said, I think there's a lot of similarities between the two programs right now in, in terms of what they're doing offensively and what we do offensively. The difference being, I think, that the Thompson kid has got the ability to push the ball down the field a little bit more consistently than we do right now. How would you maybe compare the way, you know, the offense right now um, to maybe what you envisioned at the beginning of the season? Yeah, I, it's a really interesting question because I don't really know that I envision anything. I think my job is to make sure that we can do what we need to do to win. And uh, I'd love to say, hey, we're going to put, you know, Tom Brady back there and let him pick a defense apart. But, uh, you, know, I, you know, for example, I thought Tucker in the first half was really efficient and played really well. And then for whatever reason in the second half, he didn't make as good of decisions and didn't place the ball as well. And that kind of slowed our offense down because of what they were doing defensively. You know, if he hits a couple of those slants to guys in the open field and lets them run with the ball, it's probably a little bit different game. And so um, what do you got to do at that point? You got to do what you got to do to win. And so when I, what do I envision? I envision Ws. And if that's three to nothing, two to nothing, I don't care. I mean, it doesn't matter how. It just matters how many. And so, you know, I know fans love to see explosive offense and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's sexy and I get it. Um, and I think that we have the ability to be explosive. But I think um, at the end of the day, you know, in overtime, Give the ball to 10, let him run three plays and score, and put an end to it. And uh, that's sexy to me. So whatever we got to do to get the W. And, and like I said, I mean, that's what I envision is, is I think that's what good coaching is to a large degree is uh, recognizing who your playmakers are and what you have to do to be successful against a given team. And then also be able to adjust and adapt during the course of the game when they're taking certain things away. Because, hey, guess what? They have 63 scholarship players, and their coaches get paid to do this too. So it's not all going to go to script. And uh, I think sometimes the, you know, the greater general public, they, they forget that, you know, we're not just rolling the ball out and, you know, playing against East Junior High here. It's, there's a little bit more to it than that. Coach, I think without playing Troy on offense, looked like he was kind of back to his old self defensively, speed-wise, he was able to close down and make some plays that maybe he'd been limited from the past couple of weeks. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously sat him against Norfolk State, uh, played very limited against Western Illinois, played very pretty much limited. You know, the following week we, we mixed him a little bit more, but uh, – uh, he didn't play a ton on offense, or he was really more of a defensive player for us, but it was primarily on third and th third down and second and extra long against NAU. And so, um, knowing what they were going to do to us on, on offense, we needed somebody to run the alley and track things down because we didn't want to give up those explosive plays. And so, that was uh, part of the rationale behind doing that. Plus, you know, you look at what Travis has been able to give us a little bit of the element that Troy gave us a year ago. Uh, we don't have to run guys in and out to do it. And so, um, that's, been, that's been a positive for us. We got homecoming this week. Obviously, crowd will be important once again. Yeah, I mean, it uh, it is every week for us in home games for sure. I don't know that homecomings. I don't. I don't really think that you know we're not having a bonfire or you know pep assemblies like we did when we were in high school. Maybe we are having a bonfire. I should probably ask Bethany. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's awesome for uh, people to come back. The th the cool thing to me is like I think about. At Montana State, every week's homecoming. And we got people coming from Plentywood, you got people from coming out from out of state, you know, and so I, I look at it like that. I know our, our, our student section will be rowdy and loud, and uh, we got a two o'clock kickoff, weather should be decent. Um, you know, got plenty of opportunity to, to pre function, which I think is important, so those guys can come out and be in full throat. And, uh, you know, we want people to, you know, get there early, stay late. We want to have a big crowd to sing fight song to at the end of the game. and. Uh, it's going to be important, I think, that we're playing. I mean, I don't know where this, this team is ranked, but this should be a top 12, 15 team in my mind, at least, in terms of who they played, how they played them. And uh, this is the best team that we've had come to, to the stadium this year, for sure. And hopefully we'll, that'll uh, increase the excitement. I think uh, Greg Filer is back on the depth chart this week. Are you excited to have him back? Yeah, I am excited to have him. I would have liked to have him back two, year, two, two weeks ago, but uh, didn't get that done. You know, we, we really the NAU game was the game that we were really targeting to hopefully get him back because of the style that they play. And I think that having him back and giving us some depth in the secondary will be huge. And so uh, anytime you can get a guy that's as good a player as Greg back, um, it's going to take them a little while to get into the flow of the game. But we're excited to have him back in the mix. I was going to say, is it kind of a matter of solely working him back? or No, there's no dipping your toe in the water six, seven weeks into the season. I mean, uh, he has been going through practice for the last two weeks. He hasn't been in game plan mode. But, you know, if we play some cat defense, he'll be good. You know, that means you got that cat to cover him. So it's not complicated. He doesn't have to know a whole lot. Just go get him. So. Coach, we talked a little bit last week about you know the slow starts and how your team kind of is their second half team. This week a little bit different, um, kind of give up a close game at the end after having a lead. But you know, how can you can you talk about your team just resilience and their ability to when the game's on the line, they're going to finish and get the win. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think there was a you know a really good poise by our guys on the sideline. I think that a number of times I heard them saying things like "Don't flinch" and "We got this" and. Uh, there's, there's a, a, a quiet confidence about them on the sideline. There's really not a, any panic. There's no um, pointing fingers. There's you know just, hey, next man up, let's go make a play. Defense goes out there, they're going to do their job. Offense goes out there, they're going to do their job. And I think these kids like each other. I think they do, and I think that's important. They care about each other. They don't want to let each other down. And if, they, if, if a mistake is made, they're going to support that young man and then move forward. And so I think that was a positive to see. And we've, uh, we've done that a couple times this year. And, you know. Um, it'd be nice to put together four quarters, but for some reason, when they drag these things out with you know three media times per half and all this kind of stuff, and it's it, you know, I mean, these guys are 18 to 22 years old. You know, I don't know about you guys, but when I was 18 to 22 years old, I couldn't stay focused for three and a half hours on anything, and we certainly run into that from time to time. So uh, we'll continue to work on keeping their attention span a little tighter. Maybe we need some. You know, I don't know, prescribe some meds to him for ADHD or something like that. I don't know if that's legal or not. We'll see. We'll figure out what we got to do. You mentioned, uh, or, or rather, uh, RJ, um, you know, he's not always on the field, but uh, what, what have you liked from him when he is on the field? Well, he's on the field a lot. That guy's playing a lot of football for us. He doesn't necessarily show up in the stat line, but, uh, you know, anytime we're in 12 personnel and sometimes when we're in 11, he's in the game. And he's been a relentless blocker for us. He's done a great job on special teams. Um, you know, he's probably averaging between the kick game and, and offense, he's probably right around 45, 50 plays a game. So he's playing a significant role for us on our team. Uh, he's also, I think, one of our emotional leaders, um, very much a quiet leader uh, in, in some respects, but on game day brings that emotion and always has great energy. All right, we good?
Thanks, Thanks, Selway Armory, Montana's firearm superstore, is now open for business and hiring all positions. If you want an exciting job with great compensation and one where you can become an expert in the field, put your application in now at Selway Armory. You can apply in person at their new location at the corner of Jackrabbit and Baxter or send in your application via email to employment at selwayarmory.com. That's employment at selwayarmory.com. Turn your passion into a profession with Selway Armory, Montana's firearm superstore.